All right, good evening, everybody. Let's uh, call the meeting to order at uh, 707, Greg says. Sounds good to me. So I believe Craig emailed the meeting minutes. Yep. I think you emailed them several weeks back. Yep. Yep. And you emailed them again this morning. Yep. So is there any uh, comments, corrections, changes that anybody uh, sees that need the minutes need? The meeting minutes from April's meeting. I'm looking. looking. Let's just take a look again. It's actually homework, Joe. Homework. Nice <laughs> guy. But that's okay. Catherine, any changes to the minutes from last month? Everything's good? Looks good. Russ, everything good? Everything looks good. Donna, everything's good. Craig, you typed them. I typed them. You don't get the comment, I guess. Can't check now. And I found them good when I reviewed them. So I make a motion to accept the minutes to the April meeting. Uh, do I have a second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Anybody opposed? Hearing none, be the uh, motion passes. Correct. Minutes are approved. You will see that they get sent to Denise, Denise without the draft watermark. Yep. I remember that. <laughs> We went through that last month where he sent all of the meeting minutes to Denise for past meetings that um, didn't get posted and they all had the watermark on them. Posted. Yeah, I got them wiped out. I got the watermark wiped out. And we now both know, which I did not know, that Sandra was not getting posted. She was saying nice minutes. Thank you. But she wasn't she posting. She's not the poster. She's not the poster. So, Denise. I wasn't sure. All right. So we've resolved that. Um, just a note that when I picked up the mail, um, there was a uh, slip from the town accountant that James Rock and Eva Gabavik both had been paid. Uh, this is old news, but uh, received a copy, uh, copy of the original request to pay James Rock and a uh, slip just telling us that both, uh, both of those people were paid. When did you get that? Well, I picked up the mail several days back. This was in the mail? But this could have been, this was in a mail slot. This could have been there for two months because I never thought to check our mail slot. So. Okay. How do you spell Eva's last name? Gibavik, G-I-B-A-V-I-C, G-I-B-A-V-I-C. And as I made a note, um, Catherine, for your benefit as well, uh, we got this in the mail from the State Mass Historical Commission. I don't know if you can see this at all. Uh, it is a complete printout of MACRIS, which is the Mass Historical Commission's listing of all the places in the state that are registered, yeah. registered with the state. We had gotten one in 2021, too. I have one. So I have one on my desk from a previous iteration. Does it right, have, it, in the one that from previous, which I had, taken a picture of and sent out in an earlier email, we only had four things listed under our name, under the town. Is that That has not changed. Okay. There's four things listed, but what is important, if you look at the Mass Historic District, off to the right, it does denote there is 187 properties contained in that one listing. So that right. tells me that that is all of the properties that were originally identified in Upton Center District, Upton Center North District, and West Upton District that was done back in the late 90s and had been registered, I think, in 2015. So that one listing uh, takes care of all 187 properties. So my understanding is all 187 properties are listed on the Mass Register of Historic Places. So that's all of your old homes up and down Main Street, uh, Nelson Street, where you are, Russ, over to School Street, where the Grange is, and 
uh, all of the properties in the West Upton uh, area that were listed. Yeah, here it is here. And uh, Upton State Forest Civilian Conservation Corps, it's denoting that there are 30 properties. 30 resources. 30 resources. There are two buildings, the campsite and other, this, what, about a mile of resources of forest that Yeah, so that's what's Dean Pond, Dean Pond, Park, Park, Park Road, Bridge uh, Road, and Fire Holes. Yeah. So basically all of the stuff that's in the corridor that the CCC is constructed. Okay. Well, I'll be honest, I have never in my life been in Upton State Forest, so I will have to, I will have to correct that soon. <laughs> There's an old I you there, too. <laughs> we'll do a better job of it. Yes, we will. <laughs> that would be great. Um, the Knowlton hat, hat Factory is listed as one property. Upton Town Hall is listed as one property, and it does note on here that Upton Town Hall has a preservation restriction attached to it. So very interesting what's contained in this. If anybody wants to take this home and go through it, they are more than welcome. I thought the Grange was in the state registered. It is contained in the 187 properties. Oh, okay. Which, well, is, well, which is what tells me that all of the homes that were put into the Upton Center, Upton Center North and West Upton District are all equally listed in the Mass Historic Places because we have proven that the Grange is because I actually called the, you know, Boston and they, right. after I looked it up and found it there, they looked it up because they didn't believe me. And they said, yes, it's there. That's just okay. Yeah, and that's all, in, all 187 properties. Seven. Yep. Seven. Yeah. Yes, yes, because I went in there separately. I didn't count them. I noticed there was numerous ones when I did the Grange work back in January. All right, uh, agenda item number two, Treasurer's okay. Report. Ed, do you have a question? I do have a question, Ed. Out of curiosity, if I were to ask for that binder, where could I ask permission to take that binder out? I could meet you someplace and give it to you, or uh, I could leave it with Denise downstairs. You could grab it at the town hall, or Groovy. That that would be awesome. I'd like to take a look at it. I could put it back in the mail slot downstairs. As you enter the town hall, you come up the first set of steps, go to your right, and on the left hand side is a doorway where there's a copy machine and mail slots. Oh, I'll probably pick it up on Friday. All right, I'll put it back in the mail slot. I believe it's slot M is the uh, historic commission slot, but it's in a uh, white three ring binder. Awesome. Town right. hall closes at noon on Friday. Okay, good to know. Hey, Patrick. That'd be good for you to go through and and see how the uh, the state has constructed it. But if you then go online to macris.com, M-A-C-R-I-S.com, you can find all the individual listings online, Patrick. Good to know. Okay. All right. Agenda number two, Treasurer's Report. Affected, um, what's his name? Costas. Ken. Ken. Last week, and asked him for an update of our accounts. Never heard anything from him. So, I don't have any update for our. So, as best you know, it's the same as it was in April, right. which was just shy of $1,000. So, if the money that we got from the Warren article um, for the commission. Uh, the twenty five thousand would be in a separate account, and how would we access that? And I was asking questions like that, and I didn't get any response. He I said tried, so. Tried to contact him again today. It's still going to get a response. He emails, <laughs> I think bi monthly. I'm not sure he does it monthly. He emails out all the financial reports at least every other month, and I am copied on that. And the next email, when I get that, I will look through it and see how he is, if he has put it in there and whether he's put it under a new account number or not. And I can let you know. To report well, the first sure. few times that I contacted him, I gave him, you know, like a week or so notice that I needed it and he got it to me. So I was surprised that I didn't have any information. You don't mind 
the count of the $25,000 primary care on this. Right, I know. July 1st. Yeah. yeah, that was my hunch. Yeah. And it will be in separate account. Um, the expense account associated with it. And as long as you know that account number, you can submit uh, requests to pay from. Okay. Right, right. That's good to know. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I did last time when we paid Eber and, and Jim. I looked at that to get the account number that our money was in. So, so we will report that we have the same funds as last month. No change. I think it was just under a thousand dollars of our call, like nine hundred or something. It was a thousand dollars in the um, our our regular account, and then in the donation account, it was nine hundred seventeen dollars seventeen cents. Okay. All right. Very good. All right. Any further discussion on the? All right. Item number three on the agenda is a memorandum of agreement with the Department of Conservation and Recreation regarding mitigation measures for the loss of the North Barn former supply building for the CCC camp discussed by Ellen Arnold, uh, representing the board of directors for the Friends of Upton State Forest. Ellen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for letting us come tonight. That will be here with me, Bill, as the president. Um, I remember, yes, everybody knows me, but I'm a co founder and first president. Right now, I'm not on the board, but I remain active. Um, I was historic resources chair, and I remain active and keep my hand in all of them. Um, I wanted first to remember the fact that we've had a valuable partnership in the other historical commission since 2005. Uh, at that point in time, our, our group came together as a result of our concern over the buildings of the forest. Um, and of course, I volunteered at Historical, Barbara was there, we talked about it, and she made the suggestion that um, we go to get the buildings on the Preservation Mass 2005 list of 10 most endangered historic resources in Massachusetts. And so um, Bill Johnston and I, who was our vice president at the time, came to your board and asked that if we did the work to the nation, would the board sponsor it? And you agreed to do so. Um, we Barbara, we did get the nomination. We were one of the 10 for that year. And Barbara, uh, myself, and Val Stegeman, who was uh, our interpreter of this area at the time, attended the <laughs> um, Does it mean a whole lot? You don't get a whole lot of listing except the chance to say that you're on it and you can get a lot of mileage for that and get attention of the conditions. So that was very valuable. Um, and then the second time that we came to you, I can't remember if it was Joan and I or Bill Johnston and I again, but uh, Barbara had suggested um, that you guys were working on the National Register um, at that time and you had funded more than one application. Um, so she suggested we ask for the inclusion of the CCC camp and the CCC resources um, to be part of that expenditure, which we were delighted. Um, so the commission hired Gretchen Schuler and Sherry Berg. And while they were doing, I think Sherry mostly worked on the forest, Gretchen mostly worked on the Elton Center North. Um, but the friends and DCR uh, cooperated with that. And we did, uh, we had a historic resource inventory team who spent many hours in the forest documenting what we've got up there, not just for the CCC, but there's an amazing amount of historic resources um, on you. Um, good contact, actually. So we've documented a great deal of that. We shared it with DCR. And as a result, um, we have a cultural resource management in the state forest, which is online. If any like to copy of that or see it, um, um, so we did, as you know, we were successful in the nomination. And again, um, that's been very important um, whenever we meet with public officials to mention the National Register status. Um, now, the third time that we came to was uh, sadly after the collapse of the North Barn. The first picture is one that I took. It's the very last picture of the Bale Barn standing. And for the second picture, it's one of many we took. 
when Annie took of the collapse. Um, what you can't see there, it was not a collapse. It was not a roof failure, per se. There was about two feet of snow on that roof. It was not a roof failure, per se. I have pointed out to staff and to the director of state parks and to the Office of Cultural Resources that if you look at that picture in the center where it appears it collapsed, mm -hmm. there was a foundation issue and it could have very easily have been addressed and I pointed it out two years in advance of that. Um, so uh, you probably all remember 2010, 11, the winter when we had so much snow, everybody was desperate to clear their roofs. And um, in particular, I want to say it was January 31st to February 2nd, we had historic snow uh, and, and load um, in that period of time. And on February 4th, Joan wrote a letter to the director of state parks uh, because we had been going back and forth to our local staff about getting roofs. And so she had the director of state parks. And um, after that, the two of us, I communicated times over with the partnership director and she communicated with our regional director and we got nowhere. Keep in mind, we started on February 4th. And um, so Joan kept getting the excuse that they didn't want to put men on the roof. And we kept saying, you don't have to put men on the roof. All you have to do is stand on the snowbank and you've got roof rakes. Well, at one point, Joan and I were in there daily two or three times a day. She'd go in one day, we passed each other. And um, we found one day, one of the staff, uh, probably two food, had, and he was clearing or uh, working to clear the cottage roof. And uh, we had the historic resources, uh, excuse me, the headquarters building, the most significant site of the park. We were very concerned about that concerned about the ground. Um, so anyway, this went on back and forth, back and forth. And on February 12th, Joan wrote a letter to the regional director. We're not even sure she ever got uh, before the collapse. But I did get a call from the partnership director on February 16th saying that they were hiring a contractor to come and clear the roofs. And my comment to him was, I hope it's in time. When the staff got there on February 17th, the North Barn had collapsed. Um, so we were that close. And as a result of the collapse, um, DCR determined, and there are other pictures which show it far greater than that. It was, that doesn't look so bad. You could say, oh, we could fix that. But the other pictures were horrendous. So um, the determination was made it needed to be demolished, and it required contact with Mass Historic as it was listed on the state register. And um, so what Mass Historic replied to DCR, and this is fairly typical in this situation, is that they wanted to sign the site to say what it had been in the picture and history. And I said, okay, what about the barn in 2003 that collapsed? Should we put a sign there? And what about this building that is gone? Should we put a sign there? And I said, we don't want a site of signs. We want something meaningful. And for us, that was finding ways to um, develop this cultural resources management plan. Uh, we asked for a long-range interpretive plan. That's why I'm here tonight. Um, there were other stipulations. Um, people, um, so stipulation number seven is the one you want to look at, and that is on page three. Um, no, sorry, page two. Um, so this was signed in 2011. That's and I will say to the UCR credits, the Office of Cultural Resources was amazing. In fact, the director said we put a SWAT team on it. That's the only way I can describe it because they did. Using our information we had developed through the cultural resources or the historic resources inventory, uh, they took our GPS coordinates and our information and they came out and walked the sites with us. Uh, throughout the forest and developed that plan. Um, there were other things here which they pro proposed, some things we proposed, everything there is done except for number seven. And that is to develop a interpretive plan. Now, Bill can kind of chime in on this too, but what's the importance of an interpretive plan? When the friends started, I um, was very excited about sharing with these both and everything. And we used to take well, hiking through the history. We've taken, she has 51 um, hike. 
And we take about points. And on one type, I'm pretty kind of scattered, and we're looking at the health of the party, our site, and they are fascinating. Um, and all of a sudden, I realized that there's a young me, a man and his young son off in the distance. So I went over, and they had found an open well. And the father was all interested, and the kid is right on the edge of it. I literally grabbed him. Um, so that started the concern about the wells and about, who should we be bringing people here? And the next um, situation that kind of bothered me was we went to a site that's listed in this book as a homestead versus a cellar hole. And it's a very important site at the bars. Um, it has a house foundation, a barn foundation, not a barn hole. It has, um, you can find plants around it that would have been planted as part of a homestead and a farm. Um, you can find <laughs> remnants of stone walls. And there's an incredible stone wall that leads from the barn down towards the stream. And at the end of it, there's like a big capstone. That is a well within the stone wall. And uh, what else is there? Anyway, there's also indications that at one time there was a boot shop there. And so um, this is all well and good. But about a week later, a park supervisor was out there and told me that the wealth cap had been disturbed, which greatly concerned us. And I started having second thoughts about taking people to these sites. And we felt like we needed guidance from DCR. And we also were quite involved. I was a public member of the DCR season program committee. We brought the third grade camp for educational programs. We put on events, um, educated as much as we could about the CCC. And working with the rangers there, a lot. Um, you know, but they shared how to go about things correctly. You know, we're the public, we just do things like what we want to do. We got a lot of energy and ideas, but um, interpretation is all science in itself. So that is why we included the long range interpretive plan because we felt we needed it. And this is my very cherished copy, and it's got my notes all over it, but if you just glance through it, but see what I'm talking about. So we so felt to get it to a draft stage. That's, that's, a draft. that's yeah. the very first draft. And so it was around 2014, I was contacted, which is actually beyond for two years. And um, they had started, or let me put it this way, a seasonal person had been told to do it. He had one week to draft the first like, part of it. <laughs> and so he wanted my contributions. And I'm like, it's Labor Day weekend. I've got it from New Hampshire. <laughs> But in the end, I stayed up to like two o'clock in the morning getting gathering stuff and sending it to them. We have gotten nowhere. Um, there was supposed to be a draft, which is then circulated among the ones of DCR staff or anybody in the because it's not only what the interpreters want to do, it's what can the local staff maintain and help. Uh, so they get input too. And um, Eventually, there was supposed to be a public one. We had the friends first and some other um, interested youth groups, and then a public contact content, excuse me, public meeting, and then a final draft. Now, about every six months, I contact the interpreters when I had talked to staff and the BSS. He's a regional one. Um, and I've gotten nowhere. Oh, we're working on it. Or, well, no, it's got a strong staff. It's on for still this desk. Well, I bumped into the, who's the director of state parks at a meeting once and asked her about it. She had never seen it. So I, I feel I've been patient enough. I've been friends have been patient enough. It's been more than 10 years. <laughs> we need a guide. We keep getting put off. In the meantime, they're working on resource management plans, which often will get. Them. But in order to complete them, they reduce them from something this thick to six million pages each park. I advocated to get the, res the cultural resource plan as part of the resource management plan, but we need that. And I think Bill probably can speak to that too. You know, your feelings about how much we need. Well, yeah, so. Clearly, the friends are very much interested in the Hudson State Forest. Our key interest is the Civilian Conservation Corps camp. Now, it's a unique 
It was a truly unique site. The camps were typically just the buildings were all torn down, came surplus. Um, the fact that we have a headquarters building uh, is probably the only one in Massachusetts, yes. um, and probably one of a handful across the United States. The, the, the uh, footprint of the parade ground is still there. In fact, the footprint of the camp because, um, bushes that were planted around the barracks have grown into trees. So you can see where the corners of all the barracks are. Huge trees at this point. Um, so, in any case, a, a truly unique uh, asset. And I consider it an asset for Upton and something that the Historic Commission and, 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 and the Development Committee and, you know, basically can point to and attract people to Upton. Um, but we want to do that in a way which is consistent with the way they manage their, their assets, right? We don't want to tell them, you know, Visitors, something they shouldn't hear, that sort of thing. Um, we also want to be able to be sure, we want to be sure that basically we want to be sure we're doing it right. Um, so, you know, from my perspective, it's becomes more and more important the closer we get to 2035. Not only is that the 300th anniversary of Upton, but it's the 100th anniversary of the camp. That's so truly 2020. I'm sorry, did I say 35? Yeah. It's 2025, two more years to no, the, the first the Oh, you're talking about the camp. I apologize. Yeah. 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 So in any case, 2035 is going to come up on the trail fast. And I'd like to be ahead of that in terms of us being able to interpret that particular site. And it's correct. And even more urgent, in 2025, we have the 100th anniversary of the purchase of Upton State Forest. Right. We have the 90th anniversary of the CCC's, uh, Camp at Upton, excuse me, and we have the anniversary um, years we've been around um, as of that. So, you know, we can you can you put into simple terms exactly what are you looking for? Yes, yeah, sure, yeah. that's right, because we get carried away. Yeah. Um, we've come tonight to ask that you send a letter to the commissioner. He's newly appointed. He's been around three weeks. Uh, I'll read the first paragraph, and then the rest of it is kind of backing up. It's just going to be about this. So, the interpretive plan, Dear Commissioner Rico, the interpretive plan for civilian conservation for CCC resources at Upland State Forest, the Department of Conservation and Recreation, agreed to complete under the 2011 Memorandum of Agreement between the Upland Historical Commission, DCR, Massachusetts Historical Commission and the Friends of Upton State Forest has not been completed as agreed. It's 10 years overdue. I respectfully request to expedite the completion of this important. Now, um, at the end, I said the Historical Commission supports the needs of the Friends to preserve, enhance, and protect the natural and historic resources of Upton State Forest. Now, the rest of this is just explaining the background, which she's most likely not familiar with. I suggest that the memorandum agreement be attached, please. Um, I also see friends of Upton Sparks. Um, I'm going to leave it up to you, should Mass Historic, as a primary, it's like a on around an embarrassing PCR, I like to start slowly and look because it's the most important to us. Uh, now I'm starting to pick up and if we don't get, I feel if we don't get any results from be this beginning, that at that point, I first see the contact message door. Um, so leaving that to you, if you agree to write this, um, change on it, I can I just wanted to add a couple of slides to that. Um, the current basically these are on since it was the state that required a basically an in-person analysis of whether or not there was any other way, whether it could be, should be demolished. And it was agreed that that ceiling was in the option. He's watched. And then there was supposed to become a plan. Uh, to mitigate the loss of that building. Now, in that 
part of the uh, state regulations governing how that works, uh, the interested parties are invited to consult on what can be done to mitigate the costs. And so the Public Historical Commission is invited to participate in the Federal Development State Court. So that's how we get up on that agreement. So you guys are party to the mental understanding. And to the extent that you feel as strongly about this as we do, it was entirely appropriate for you to write a letter and say, okay, how the same thing done. So what exactly is an interpretive plan? Um, I knew you'd ask that question. I have a concept of what it is, but I want you to tell me what uh, you believe it yes, is. Yes, it's a guide. I would call it a guide, first of all. And if I could just borrow that. If you start with a vision, and then from the vision, work into themes. And then you get all of what you have are that comes up with this vision and these things. And you figure how to best interpret them while still impacting the resource and how to engage the public. Um, and uh, right here, interpretation is a mission-based communication process that forges emotional and actual intellectual connection between the interested audience and the meanings, uh, meanings inherent. So, uh, so, so one part would be for someone to write a history of the property. The other would be how do you communicate that history with the public? It's not a history as I think of a history. Um, I think of a history as a book, uh, inclusive. It identifies, uh, first of all, what's important to the public. What is it about this park that sets it off from everybody else? Um, what they have, what I've advocated for, is an addition to um, include, making it all about the camp and the CCC resources, is that we have the perfect opportunity within the forest to identify what led to the need for the CCC. You have early colonial uh, work, and if you've ever been to Harvard Forest and seen the dioramas, they are often at one time was barely forested. It was mostly farms, fields, pastures. Um, and then moving forward, um, how we use the resources that were left, and then as left farming moved on, the forest came back, and then had logging, and that became critical because um, logging at the time was pretty much the cutting, causing erosion, and um, in some cases fires. So I've advocated to have that part of the story leading up to the CCC period, uh, and and within this plan they've agreed. Um, the basic goals include preserving cultural resources, protecting the forest critical habitat, managing the forest as a look, maintaining safety and access. That's management goals. And then um, what is here is important is adaptive reuse because the camp is continually used after the CCC level by various agencies and organizations right up until about 2003. Um, that's what preserved the camp. And as Bill pointed out, we're the last one in Massachusetts, one of the few in the Northeast, and one of the very few in the nation. Um, so does the DCR have the competency and the capability to write such an interpretive plan? I assume yes, they do. They do. It's amazing. It's a matter of uh, getting them to assign their resources to us. Exactly. You hit the hit nail on the head. And we've been late waiting ten on this. And is this the letter that you would send if you were to send them a letter to give them a kick in the Yes, I've had Bill review with he made some suggestions, and I expect that you might have you might want to tailor it to your own need. The only thing I'm uncertain about, and I defer to you, is would you include just Mass Historic as a CC? Uh, they were a signer. It's perfectly appropriate. To if have. you if if you were to approach this in as soft a fashion as possible, without being too soft, as a start, I would absolutely include Mass Historic. I would copy them. Okay. That sounds good. Saying, yeah, we're we're going after DCR to finish what they agreed to finish, and here's a copy of what we're asking so that they've heard it. Um, so that if a second letter six months from now or a year from now were to be sent, it would probably not be as written as softly. True. Yeah, actually, I think that's entirely appropriate because the agreement itself, uh, its genesis was the state law that governs 
the as the uh, property zones, the historic registry governed by the Mass Historic Commission. Uh, so, I mean, basically, it was it was their body of law that created the agreement. Sure. So, what resources are being applied to that property to preserve what's left? Well, we're very happy with that because on the cultural resources side, which is the Office of Cultural Resources, through the Historic Curatorship Program. Um, they have, and the friends have involved in this too, because they provide some funding. We've done several matching grants with them to do work on the building, the headquarters building in particular. Um, right now, they have an MOA with BDT. Unfortunately, the MO, first MOA started in 2020, a three-year MOA, but it was renegotiated. And um, the building, the interior headquarters building has been basically stripped. Um, and there's quite a plan in place. Um, I've seen the documents of what's going to happen for structural work, what's going to be their offices. There's going to be a handicapped bathroom. Um, and so they ripped out everything, in, especially East Elm. Um, they're preparing to do the rough plumbing. Um, you know, this is going to be, I mean, we're not talking about next year or the year after even. It's going to be a long-term project, but there will be an office and a small kitchen in one L, another L. I, Think they might be dedicating toward like DCR use, which could be a conference space. And DCR is funding all this. Part of it, uh, yes. Um, and the friends have contributed through. We contributed to rebuilding the porch. We rebuilt the handicap ramp um, with some of the other projects we've done. Flagpole, um, the siding, we contributed to the siding, uh, which has been repaired. Um, they also, at one point, went in after the collapse of the barn. And um, they obtained funding to stabilize the building. So the piers underneath the building have been replaced, and they've done structural work inside the building. So I'm not worried at this point in time. Inside which building? The headquarters. Building. Oh, yeah. you, went, you went, um, went from the barn. I, I got, I'm lost sorry, with, got lost with it. After the barn, yeah. Uh, yeah, because that was a major embarrassment for yeah. them. It was. Um, and I have to say, quite honestly, um, if the barn hadn't collapsed, I'm not sure we'd be here, unfortunately. Mm. But we have brought a lot of attention. We've put our own funding into it. It's usually a two-third match uh, with grants. How long has the Friends of the State Forest been in existence? 2005. So 20 years, 18 years. Close. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, by uh, 2025, 20th anniversary. Right. Also happens to coincide with the... 100th anniversary of the first parcel and the state bought in Upton that was ultimately became part of the state forest. Most of the empty state forest was acquired in connection with the um, employing CCCs. Okay. That, that's, that's a fascinating story. <laughs> well. But the, the interesting thing is, is the work that's being done in the building, that the interpretive plan is eventually going to become part of how that building gets used. Because mm -hmm. that'll be part, just for being there, be part of the interpretive program. But the parts that be built, part, part of the building may be dedicated to, you know, basically a museum for the site. The central portion would be expected to be some sort of interpretive, um, like I don't, I picture maybe the walls as interpretation. And um, perhaps a few cases or something, but you have an original CCC built fireplace in there, which is amazing. Um, so it, at this point, it's not written in stone. So this plan <laughs> right here is very important. Um, well, I'm happy to review this, maybe add a little, uh, add the, uh, the Mass Historic Commission as a copy on it, send it out for everyone to take a look at to see if anybody's got any grammatical or uh, functional comments to it, and then we can uh, we can mail this to the uh, the new the new commissioner. The new commissioner, three weeks on the job. Can you email this document to me? I can. So, if anybody's interested, email the cultural resource management plan link. That would be great. Anybody got any other uh, comments they want to add to this? Other than I, I have been to the. She should she camp in Cedar, Florida. New. It is a wonderful resource, and uh, they bring in hundreds and hundreds of people like all season long. 
probably thousands of people. I don't um, think they, they have a, a, um, a, a truck that pulls a wagon that people can sit in mm -hmm. and they bring it through the um, parkland, uh, uh, you know, the trail that you can't go on with your car. They do have a circle uh, uh, ride that you can go on and stops along the way where there are trails that you can hike on. And I, it's just such a it's wonderful fantastic. resource in that area. I mean, it's just they have it's imagination. Um, yeah. In fact, there's a Facebook group. It's called CCC Legacy um, and our Civilian Conservation Corps Legacy. And there is a national organization located in Virginia. Right there. I think they even have a, a, like a United States map with lights with all the camps. Where all the camps are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, um, yeah. Many of the camps, many states now have the CCC strike statue too. Um, Massachusetts, it's located in Freetown. Uh, it should be located at Upton. Um, anyway, we'll get into that. <laughs> well, I think this is very appropriate. Uh, thank you for bringing it to our attention. You'll email me all of the documents you can email. Um, when can I or the whole commission get a tour? Anytime. We obviously would contact our park staff yeah. and just get permission to take you through. I'm sure that you can come see, and I'm happy to take you around and show you. The, you want to go for a walk in the woods? Yeah. Well, either sometime in the next two weeks, or they would have to wait to July because I'm not around the June. Okay. Well, you know, Bill, I'm kind of you're the one with the schedule. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, anytime that it's not raining, I mean, I'd also if. It's time enough. I could perhaps arrange for the uh, historic curatorship director to be out, and um, we can take. We can certainly get permission to take you through the building. Yeah, we should see if we need Tansy. We should. Yes. Tansy is. Sorry. I'm sorry. Is she? Yes. She's a local VSS visitor services supervisor. Hey, she's basically the interpreter for right. the Blackstone Conference. Yeah, and she's very <laughs> new with us, so I'm not sure how much into the CCC or our updates history she is yet. But um, it would be good to have. Uh, it'll probably have to be. <laughs> that, that, that's probably more realistic. And um, like I said, I've got two and a half weeks before I leave. Um, we can try and get this done. Why am I leaving? It shouldn't take that long to. Uh, you, you've, I was going to ask you to write the letter, and then we could review it and modify it as, as required. You've already written the letter, so. Try to make it easy, but um, I more than appreciate the time tonight and your support. And obviously, um, from 2005, this commission has supported the work, and it's valuable. Um, so we give you credit. Thank you. Well, it helps that it's listed on the Mass Register of Historic We're Places. Looking, so. <laughs> yes, and my yeah, almost it's trying so yeah, hard. Almost to take care of it. Um, they considered putting the camp in Milford, and at one time they considered it going on Peppercorn. Um, uh -huh. There was local objection in the area. They were all very concerned about what 200 young men descending on the town looked like. Um, so they ended up at Upton State Forest, which we're happy about. Um, uh, and the reason that building is still here, the still here. after the seas left. Uh, National Youth Administration, which is another. Was that one of the alphabet programs? Yeah, right alphabet yeah. Youth programs was there for six months, I think. I think they actually brought in, it was a vocational training, and I think that's the one I'm explaining to the kids who work on it. Um, after they left the camp, a few days in the summer there. And after they spent their summer, they bought 100 acres of the university and grew in the camp ever since up there. Uh, and then probably most. Meaningful activity after that was um, what not what is now Fisheries and Wildlife. They created, um, oh, I forgot, Camp Stover. Camp Stover. So the National Guard used it and did some training there. Um, and then um, <coughs> and what became Fisheries and Wildlife uh, created uh, the Phillips Wildlife Laboratory. And, and they did all sorts of studies over a 10 year period. And when they left, they went to Westboro. Some of the studies they did at Upton really um, are the basis for a lot of um, their work today and a basis for some of the taking laws in Massachusetts. Very interesting studies that we could do a whole book on just uh, Phillips Wildlife Lab. So anyway, we'll get out of your here tonight. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay.
Moving on to item number four, Heritage Park sign, next steps. So what I think we need to do at this point is to uh, draw up the um, specs for producing, reproducing the sign, which we probably should have something that we use to send BBT in the first place. Uh, to use that, ask Joe Layden to review it. And when it's written and reviewed and Joe's happy with it, we can send it to, I don't remember his name, Derek at, the, sure. at BBT and tell him that you have won the you have won the project. Please schedule it come September, October, and see if we can have a sign before next winter. So I don't remember if I wrote up a scope for Derek or if you wrote up something for Derek. We need to put into a document what we're asking them to produce. Okay. Size, scope, finish, materials. Nothing terribly complicated, but a page worth of what it is. Information. Yeah. <laughs> You want to tackle that first? I'll look and see if I've got anything that I, I can send over to you. Sure. Anybody have any other thoughts on the Heritage Park sign? Who? Nope. Catherine, Patrick. <laughs> okay. Hearing none. Item number five, Grange building update. Um. As I think I reported last month, the Mass Historical Commission had sent a letter back to the Grange after the um, after receiving their application, um, stating that there were three items missing. Um, one was an assessor's map, which we thought we had included, but it was actually they wanted a whole map of the whole neighborhood. So that was a two-minute project to get that downstairs. They asked for the attorney who wrote up the letter that um, the attorney that did the title review, uh, he was supposed to type the description of the property from the deed into his letter. Attaching the deed apparently wasn't sufficient. They wanted it typed into the letter. <laughs> so that took another three and a half minutes. So we accomplished that. And then the third thing they wanted was they wanted a letter from the state Grange stating that they would accept a preservation restriction be placed on the property, which we thought uh, we had covered back in February. Well, the state Grange dragged their feet and dragged their feet and dragged their feet. And then um, Kristen went to a meeting two or three weeks ago on a Saturday where she knew all the executive committee members would be there. They weren't having a meeting, but she knew they would be there. So she talked to each of them personally. And apparently they didn't like the language that the state was asking them to put into it. And we feared that the state was not going to provide a letter agreeing to the preservation restriction. Well, Kristen sent them an email, copied me on it, and Two days later, she got a call to come pick up the letter. So with a day to spare, we sent the three documents to the state that the state needed. And then after the town meeting on May 4th, I asked Joe Layden to put together a letter stating that the uh, the town spoke had approved the CPC funds for the uh, restoration of the building. Um, he sent a copy to me. I forwarded it to Kristen. She emailed it to the state. The state came back and said we need it certified and we need it in writing, which I knew they were going to. So, so Kristen came over here one afternoon to pick up the letter and discovered that it referred to the wrong warrant article. So the letter had to be revised <laughs> while she was here for a couple hours. And Denise had to certify it. And long story long, that letter got sent. So the understanding at this point is because of the information the state historical commission wanted we have to believe that they're still in the running so unless we hear anything at all in the next couple of weeks which we don't expect the date is june 24th for the announcement of who receives the grants from the state for restoration works and if the grange receives the grant uh, i can only hope they receive it and i can only hope they receive it in full not a partial 
But one of the fears that I have is that more money is being asked for than the state has available, that they may accept everyone who submitted an application and all the documents and do a percentage of the total based on how much money they have. And I say that because of the cost of the architect and the attorney, which would not have been part of the project had we not submitted a state grant. It just redu it would just reduce the value of the uh, the grant, but it is what it is at this point. If they get the grant award in late June, then the next step is a meeting July 6th and I think July 7th that they're asking the lead project coordinator and the architect to attend. So that would be Ken Paulson and Scott Richardson, the architect. And I told Ken Paulson that if Scott Richardson decides he will not attend, I will probably go in with him and see what the state says we have to do as next steps, which my understanding is basically begin to prepare the bid documents to be sent out to uh, contractors to bid. And there's 60 days for the preparation of the bid documents that have to be accepted by the state commission. And I assume by people like Joe Layden, who's uh, the uh, Upton's procurement uh, officer. Even if this thing is passed and, and we go ahead with everything, project to work on the building <clears throat> probably won't happen until next spring. Well, there's, there's, there's two possibilities. Uh, if we get a state grant, work on the building could not happen until early November which suggests that maybe some could be done in November, but likely it would be next April, March, April, May, depending on how the winter goes. Uh, if the state does not award a grant, then the Grange is on their own. Then technically we don't need an architect and we could prepare the bid using Joe Layden's help and put the bid out on the various sites that it goes out on the state sites for bid and whatnot and ask local people to bid. So I think it gets a little bit easier. Huh. Uh, and under that, it, it would seem to me it would be possible to have bid documents sometime in August and put it out to bid and give them a deadline at the end of September such that work could begin in October or November. But we have to wait till June 24th before we'll do any work using CPC funds anyway. So we'll have to wait and see if the state awards the grant or not. Yeah. That will determine where we go next with the work. Um, I think the good news is the 120,000 from the CPC should be sufficient to put a roof on the building, repair the siding and paint the building, which is a significant piece of what was originally intended. If we get the state grant, then there'll be um, handicap ramp replacement, uh, fire escape repairs, uh, front step repairs, um, and with any hope, depending on how expensive the project is, replacement of all the windows, which would be the last phase. Uh, that the replacement of the windows is outside of the uh, Mass Historic Commission project scope, the way it got complicated and 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 laid out such that the if the grant is received the project scope is roof siding paint handicap ramp fire escape front steps period when all that is done and when the state signs off and pays us then in theory there would be enough money left from the cpc to replace the windows or do some other piece of it so that's the update on the grange Item number seven, we're an article for the Historical Commission. Uh, as everyone I hope knows that passed, we now, or I guess as of July 1st, we'll have $25,000 in our coffers to do whatever projects we decide need to be done around town. Uh, with the only stipulation that I gave the, uh, the Board of Selectmen and the town manager is that any project we come up with, we would define the scope of and submit it to the town manager for Board of Selectmen review and approval, such that we wouldn't have to wait for the biannual town meeting, town people vote, the money's already approved. We would just need to convince the selectmen and the town manager that what we want to do is appropriate and worth the funds. <clears throat> so we do have um, one 
project that's been on the uh, agenda for quite some time, and that's repairing the missing storm windows on Holy Angels. So those are the two front windows. Those are the two front, and there may be one on one side or both sides that are missing half of them. Yeah. But even replacing the ones on the sides to preserve that building. I don't know. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't appear that the EDC or the selectmen or any have come up with any ideas in that building. So it could sit it for another ten years and stare back at us. <laughs> and by that time, the roof will be leaking in several more places. And so uh, I suppose when I get back from my vacation, that maybe I'll draft a short um, bid specification, and we can send it to a couple of local uh, contractors and ask them for um, bids to replace the or repair the missing storm windows on Holy Angels and see what that. Those were just plexiglass windows, weren't they? Yeah, as I recall. I don't, I don't think they were safety glass. I think they're just plexiglass. Yeah, yeah. yeah. plexiglass, yeah. And they were just one sheet <coughs> of, I don't know, yep. something like. One, one big piece. You know, panes in it. I, I just don't want to spend a ton of money. I don't want to spend a ton of our 25000 doing that. So right. hopefully we can find someone that could do it for five or $6,000. But I don't know. But I I don't know if they would do something like that. Yeah, maybe they, that might be a specialty service. I know Kevin can never remember his last name. Windows that are on the side of that building. Um, you were with me when we went upstairs in the North Steam building and yeah. found the original window They're in the attic that were in that church. Yeah. So apparently when um and I think that those were the two from the original German um stained glass windows. The the windows that were in the there that might have been taken out. And then with Mr. Paulson did the <laughs> remaining four windows, the windows. The original that, ones were taken out and then just put it in the library or the ultimate machine yeah. in the attic. What windows so when were? They took, so when they took the stained glass windows out, moved them up to the new church, <laughs> St. Gabriel's, they didn't put the original windows back. So they no. must. They're, they're just sitting there. They're not great shake, so they're just, they're just like a design. But it's uh -huh. just painted on it. Oh, okay. Yeah, because the a couple of the stained glass windows were removed and put in St. Gabriel's. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because a I'm couple were from there. I think about the original from... windows that were there. Originally, there were only two stained glass windows. So what did they replace the stained glass when they took them up to St. Gabriel's? What did they put back into Holy Angels? That's what I just said. Correct. There's, there's clear windows now. Where do you see now? So they either weren't aware that the original windows existed. And they went and did something. Yeah, probably. The win the original windows weren't anything special. No, they were multi-pane glass. Yeah. Just like painted, yeah. painted glass. Well, I don't know how valuable the uh, the windows are. Maybe I can ask Ken Paulson to take a look at them some point and say, is there any value to those windows in Holy Angels or not that we're trying to protect and preserve? Right. You know. That'd be a good. In because I ask? would imagine in 15, 20 minutes, he could look at them and tell them that they, they're they valuable, but they would need to be completely disassembled and, and re-leaded and everything because they're so old and wet. Late in the next two weeks, you want me to talk to Ken about that? Yeah. Absolutely, Jim. Sure. What's the, uh, what's the potential value of them and what's the condition? Okay. The only other um, project idea that I've had for a couple of years is the work that I did at Old First Cemetery up off of Grove Street that I would like to do some work to restore the headstones in that cemetery. And there's 12 to 15 broken, damaged headstones, all of the 1750 to 1830 time frame with I think several of them in the around 1800 that are broken. Uh, I did a attend a seminar in Menden last summer where a, uh, 
a husband and wife from North Smithfield came into one of the Menden cemeteries at the request of the Historical Commission in Menden uh, and showed people how to uh, not only clean headstones properly, what materials to use, what to do, what not to do, uh, but he also uh, repaired a uh, large uh, mid-1800s limestone headstone that had broken in half uh, and did the repairs on it. Hmm. Now, I, I can't say I'm comfortable enough to go buy the materials and just go do one. Yeah. But I certainly would like to know if we could find some volunteers in town younger than me that would be willing to spend several weekends doing repair work. And if we could find some people that are willing, then maybe I could find Carlos and his wife and see if we could get an hour or two of his time to show us how to do one and then go about repairing the rest of them ourselves. And I'm wondering, Patrick, if that might be something appropriate for um, our Facebook page, looking for volunteers to help restore broken headstones at Old First Cemetery. I think that would be a fantastic thing to put out there. Uh, if you, Ed, if you give me all the details, like if you want to jot something down, then I can wordsmith it on on the social media. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I would I would definitely want to be part of that uh, team. That sounds great, and I think I can probably find a couple people who might want to do it too. Um, none of the stones are terribly heavy. That's the good news. The uh, I think the heaviest stone that's broken is Cyrus Vale. <laughs> and I'm not going to do it today, but someday I'll give you the history that I've learned in the last year of Cyrus Vale, the man that drowned in the West River because he refused to pay his taxes when the when the town came to foreclose on his property. So. He's buried at Old First Cemetery, and his stone is broken. And I'm kind of reluctant to spend any money to fix his stone because he never paid his taxes. But uh, <laughs> but it's a beautiful stone. Bail. Bail. B a i l. B a i l. And his property was Maplewood Cemetery, the entire Maplewood Cemetery property west to the West River. And his father owned that land and another 40 acres west of the West River going towards uh, Northbridge. Mm -hmm. And that bridge up the street from the DPW, this gentleman here told me, is the, is the Cyrus Vale Bridge or the Vale Bridge. I had never heard that story. But yeah, it was on the Vale's bridge. It was on his, on his property. He jumped in. He yeah, jumped in. Well, if you go to Upton, if you go to Upton. If you go to Upton Fire Department's website, and I, I ask all of you to do this, you'll see that they have the history of the first recorded fire in Upton. And the first recorded fire was when Cyrus Bale uh, set all his buildings afire and jumped in the river and the fire department that existed in 1836 went to his property to, to douse the flames, I guess. Jeez. And they found him the next morning in the river drowned. What a character. Huh? Never married. He was in his 50s, I think, and he's buried over at Old First. He fought the British, his, so we didn't have to pay taxes. His father and grandfather. He didn't to pay his taxes. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> oh, it's a great story. The whole point. His father, I think, was in the... I should have mentioned this on Memorial Day when I get my spiel. That is good. That's <laughs> a Secretary. Part, <laughs> I would have to look it up, but I suspect his... He would have been born about 1780. So his father, Edward Vale, would have probably served in the revolution. Uh -huh. So he bought the land in 1778. So he was in Upton during the revolution, Edward uh -huh. Vale. Don't know where one. Anyways, enough of that. So if anybody else has ideas for, uh, or we will have an, a fund of $25,000 that hopefully will last us several years because one of the questions the selectman asked me was, are you going to come back every year for this? And I said, geez, I hope not. Yeah. <laughs> I hope it's just something that right. we'll have money for the next 10 or 12 or 15 years for what we need to do. Um, if we can check off the, uh, the, the storm windows at Holy Angels, uh, the money we would need to do repair work at Old First Cemetery probably would not exceed $1,000, $1,200, buying mortar and 
and epoxy to do the uh, repair work. That would be a, a low a low cost repair project. One thing I'll mention is there's a lot of ticks in that cemetery. I, I was out there and I got a ticky, so you might want to be careful with that. You cleared the brush out of it? I was helping clear all the brush out of it a year ago and uh, yeah. clean stones, and I never got a tick on me, but maybe oh, yeah. I was lucky. <laughs> <laughs> poison ivy. Yeah. 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 <laughs> don't, don't remind me of the poison ivy. <laughs> Do we I may think some of those headstones are buried under the ground. I think they yeah. might be under. They might be I don't believe so. No. No, I went through the whole thing. I believe all the lots are pretty well identified. I don't think there's any uh, hidden stones, has been, as has been rumored. Um, because the DPW had agreed a year ago, uh, every year uh, as part of their tree removal in town, apparently the outfit that they use dumps the wood chips from chipping and all the branches and everything behind the DPW barn. And every year they have to dispose of that pile of wood chips. So one of the proposals that Dennis Westgate had was move the pile over to Old First and use it to spread and fill ruts and holes and and I said it's worth trying, but uh, again, he, he had a great idea, but it's been 15 <laughs> months. He hasn't moved the truckload yet. Nope. He still says he's going to. You know, I saw him so a couple of weeks ago. Keep it mowed and. Uh, but that part of the plan was that would help keep. Yeah, it mowed I know, I know. To cover over some of the rocks and it's oh. rocks sticking up everywhere. Well, I don't know how they buried people in that piece of land. That, I know. The, there must be five boulders for every square foot. Right. And some of them are huge. Yeah. But I guess they no, brought in the office. Uh, New that, England. Dug a hole, it's yeah. It's rocks, New England. The rocks work to work their way up to the top and service. And we're sure not going to turn it into farmland because it's uh it, it, it's 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 a no value for farmland, so we'll use it for a cemetery. And I think that's probably how it happened, but who knows? All right, moving right along. Um number eight, social media update and review. Patrick, you're on the spot. So all day today, I've been trying to practice my uh, Walter Cronkite because I feel when I'm on the screen, I feel I need to have like a mustache and, you know, greet the American, you know, public and be like, you know, on tonight's topic today. But um, anyways, safe to say that we've been doing very well on social media. I'm sure you probably have seen some of the things with all of our posts about the Grange, about the Upton Community Center. Definitely being there uh, when we did the walk across, you know, the we were there, we, were, we made history. Um, we've also connected on a lot of different pages as well. Definitely with Friends of Upton Library, Friends of Upton Forest. When the community center opened and when they opened everything, Historical Commission was actually trending on Facebook for an hour. So uh, definitely for a while, we were trending meaning we were in that top 10 of things that were being seen in within the upton area so we're definitely on the right track with things as always if there are things you need me to promote if you need me to put things up there send it to me email it to me i can even give you my phone number if you want to text things to me and overall i'd say things are going very well well, I need a lesson from you in person one of these days because I, I found the site the other day and I couldn't find anything about the Grange uh, on it. Do you know how to work this site? I'm not, uh, I'm not very talented. I've never used Facebook. I don't use it. You don't use it either. So you got people on the commission here that I suppose we need to get our act together. And uh... Well, I see all your posts because I comment on a lot of them. <laughs> yes. I do. You, are, you are our number one contributor on the site <laughs> which i almost put a thing out there saying like who can knock off our contributor because right now we've got our top contributor i don't know we might have to put a record out there we might have to like snap a photo and be like this is our best contributor you know elon musk eat your heart out like we have one of the best contributors out there <laughs> Well, I think that, and I think we should all go across the street to the uh, the new uh, facility in the uh, Holy Angels Church for a drink after every meeting, but nobody's come up with the idea what to put in that building yet. So. Right, right. <laughs> all right, you all set, Patrick? All set. Okay, number nine, this is the meeting. Upton's 300th anniversary, uh, discussion of planning and funding by the committee members. And I would add, based on Ellen and Bill's presentation, that 
maybe the 300th anniversary should include something with the CCC camp. Right. Yeah. Definitely. So amendment amendment number one, Donna. <laughs> that's, that's the hundredth anniversary, right? That they said. That's their hundredth. Yes. Yeah. Twenty thirty five is the town's three hundredth, and they told us it's the CCC's hundredth. So Donna and I have <laughs> sat and chatted about this, and you know the time frame, how far out we are, and we think that you know the most crucial thing for us is that we have to start considering how we're going to get money to do anything. But you know, we need. Probably, you know, I don't know how much you would need. I'm thinking $100,000 is not too little to ask because you're going to have fireworks, you're going to have parades, parades are expensive, fireworks are expensive, um, and then I'm sure other things throughout the year. Uh, so I, I meant to ask Bill before he left, but he seemed to be in a hurry. Uh, he was the one that originally said to me that we should ask the town for a chunk of money each year so that it wouldn't be like going at, you know, two years before the the celebration and asking for $100,000. And, you know, that would be asking for so much. But if they gave us like $10,000 a year to put in um an account someplace, you know, that we could use that money, um, that would be helpful. So I uh, contacted Joe and I, I told him that we were starting to plan for the 300th and one of the topics was financing the event and that we knew in the past that the town had uh, contributed to this these events. And we had this idea about a yearly amount being set aside. And he got back to me and said, I think there should be a discussion about creating a gift account. I do not believe that the town, as part of an operating budget, can contribute money. I'll, re I'll reach out to other towns who recently had 300th anniversaries and see how town as a government provided funding. The town may be able to create a gift account to be used by the town committee, but it is what I'll need to look into. And I don't believe we can use tax money. Well, this thought that occurs to me is I think we would be well served if we had a plan for what we would like to do throughout the year, which would then lead to a budget rather than to worry about financing before we have a plan of what we want to do. Now, Menden must have just had their 350th in 2017. So maybe there's someone there to tell us how they, because they had a bunch of events throughout the year. And Mil Milford, I think, had their 300th. Or was it Northbridge? Northbridge. Northbridge. They just had theirs within the last couple of years. Milford, I don't even think it's 150 years old. Right. Northbridge would have, yeah. Yeah. Also, Bath, it's 300. And Brafton. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Yeah. So, we will contact those three towns and see. Go, Nita. A uh, what do you call it? 300th anniversary committee. I already talked yeah. to somebody. The various board the, members. Okay. I talked to somebody on the that was on the 275th and asked if he would be available to do it. He said if he's alive. <laughs> <laughs> but if he, he were, he was in my kindergarten class. He better be alive. <laughs> oh, so he's younger than us. I mean, I might have to come in a wheelchair, but. <laughs> but if we incorporated the uh, the annual fireworks, that's already funded in some fashion. Right. And right. things like that. And, and that, that put it all into a master plan. Right about the time that the, the celebration, I mean, the, the birthday is June the 14th. And typically our fireworks are like 
the Saturday for the 4th of July. There was one something like that. Once it ran around in the July 4th, and then it was let's have it the weekend yeah. before July 4th, and then it rained, so let's have it the weekend before the that. It's absurd. Yeah. It's not July 4th. So it's, it's been around the 23rd, 24th. We could always plan it for June we, 14th yeah. with rain delay dates. Right. Right. Yeah. Move it up. I mean, they can get up anyways. Huh? Mm-hmm. We'll have it at Christmas for July 4th yeah. when it's gone. Well, this is because it's a little bit cheaper than having it on the 4th of July. Instead of the fireworks, you get a little discount. I always approach the men's club. Yeah. yeah they're, very, they're very helpful. But did you come up with any thoughts on events or? Um, well, we didn't get together because it was been. We, we kind of talked, but didn't yeah. sit down. Right. A rough outline of events like a marching bands, school bands, floats, things that any, you know, parade would have. We had the Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, town officials. Bloomer girls all you know Grange to match, and I did think of activities like the children's crafts and things like that, like scavenger hunt, essay contests, color contests. I won a coloring contest once. I got a Arthur Godfrey ukulele. <laughs> Don't you wish you still had it, huh? My kids broke it. Oh, I did have it. <laughs> So so dancing. So square dancing. Yeah, because that's, yeah, my, my, yeah, my relatives used to do square dancing all yeah. the time. And the trivia contest. The trivia contest, yeah. Um, Upton's trivia, we'll have to have Patrick come up with questions. Yeah. <laughs> well, if, if there's some way you could type that up, yeah. even as a draft outline, because okay. the other concern, the other thing we should be doing is, we want to be able to pass this on. Yeah. You're not on the board. You're not on the board. Now that it's 12 years from now, right. we can, we can well, pass this on so that we don't have somebody presenting to us about the CCG camp, something that we've never heard about before and, and wasn't on a list of things that, that maybe we should have had. That yeah, This happened 10 years ago, but one of the things that's been on my mind is that we create an outline that can be passed as any of us move on, that the next person comes in and says, this is what the commission has done in the last 15 years. And we're a historic commission. We're not a present commission. We're, we're maintaining the history of things. So I want to look in the um, historical society's file. And they've got, you know, lots of stuff on the last 275th. And, well, yeah. And what they, and what they yeah. mostly did for like fundraisers. That's so what have been 1985? We would have had that's 250th. Right. Yeah. That sounds all right. 275. 85 yet. Okay, 250th. Yeah. They have all that in the historical. Are you on that committee? No. <laughs> well, the historical society um, published a book of their history for the 200th <laughs> anniversary. Yeah. Right? In 1985, that. And then the, the book by Don Johnson was published then. So start getting ready to write a book, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we could improve on those two books, though. We can't invent new history. <laughs> well, we do have a book that was just published on Upton Civil War soldiers. That was published about two weeks ago, and... Uh, the gentleman's supposed to get me copies for the Historic Society, for myself, for I think town clerk, and I think I think there's four copies coming. Oh, good. So we can put those. Well, on I'm the, glad that oh, the Historical Society will get <laughs> one. That's nice. <laughs> are they going to be able to uh, by the public, or are they just going to have copies that I mean, each place has? I'm probably going to give mine to the historic society as well, so that yeah. it'll be available for the public to look at. Yeah. Okay. I mean, they're available for purchase too, because yeah. it's a publisher that's doing this. So. That sounds interesting. You know what? When they will have that? Or... 
in theory, they've been published. So I would think someone yeah. could order one now. I didn't I didn't try to look it up, but I think it's Damiano's Publishing. Which I know is out of Framingham or... What was the name of the book, do you know? Just Upton Civil War. Soldiers are Upton Civil Wars. History by Tom Ellis. Ellis? E-L-L-S? Yep. Yeah. He's done about a dozen towns. He's picking ones that are, you know, nothing has ever been done in. And I worked with him last year while he was putting it together. I want to make sure we didn't miss anybody that was born here and served, that came into town and served, that served somewhere else and died here and was buried here, or anybody who in his 200 and something individuals. So it's quite a large number for a small town. It's just like somebody told me when I started doing my research. 25 years ago that if you go back to the revolutionary revolutionary war if somebody was 15 years old and male he probably did something in the revolution even if you can't find a record of it so either they either fled to canada because they were loyalists or they um i had one of my ancestors where i actually found a letter his sister wrote for his pension and it said that when he was 15 years old he ran away from home with his gun to go fight in the war and dad had to go look for him. I just sat there and cracked up laughing for about 10 minutes saying it's scary. from 250 years ago. And I find a letter where his sister who was there in their seventies said that he, he ran away from home with his gun and dad had to go, dad had to go chase him, chase him down and bring him home. Did they find him? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he, he died at the age of 82. So well, I, guess they, I suspect they found him. Well, my son just went to Arlington with his family, the Arlington Cemetery, and they he didn't walk up to the grave site, but there was a James M. Kempton in there, and that, of course, is my husband and my son's name. I'd like to know what the middle initial is, yeah. and M. I would like to know what that name is. Yeah. And, of course, he died in the Civil War, but there's not any really record on his grave site other than he was in the Civil War, mm -hmm. and they did the, his birth date. Um, Assuming he's just a young man, and this is the record. Because my son is also trying to do all the history of, of the family. So mm -hmm. all of the books of the Civil War over at the Society, and yeah. you can look his name up. And we look through. I mean, name. but you might well. We have a little initial. Maybe the to think. Well, I'm headed to Andersonville Prison in three weeks. Which is in southern Georgia. That was the major prison during the Civil War. Yeah. My great grandfather was there for nine months. Okay. And we have a picture of it at the historical <laughs> museum. If you were, if you wanted to email me that, I'd see what I could find as well. Send me an email with the name and what you what little you know, and I'll see what I can find. Did you ever look at that big picture that we have up at the Society yeah. Andersonville that that yep. man drew from memory? Yep. After being incarcerated there, it's yep. really insane. The most amazing picture is the one in the um, Gettysburg Museum that was painted in the 1880s of the day three of the Gettysburg War. Mm -hmm. He painted it from talking to hundreds and hundreds of people that were there and participated. And it's 80 feet long and 12 feet high. Mm -hmm. They restored it and they built a a new building in 2008 or nine, and it has a rotunda, and the painting encircles the rotunda. Wow. It is the largest, most incredible, with hundreds and hundreds of figures on it and battles going on here and here, and it was painted to be as realistic as possible of what people said they really experienced during that day three of the battle. Anyways, we're getting off track. If you want to put that into some sort of draft form that we can play with, then uh, that would be fantastic. Then we can chip away at it, add to it, and hit up Mr. Layden for money several more times before before he says we can't do it. It would seem to me, and I would hope you find this from talking to a few of the other towns, that the other towns have gotten public money to have a uh, right a large find out how they did that. Yeah. And it would it would seem to make sense, which I didn't think of before, that if we went in and said we want ten thousand a year for the next ten years or whatever the number was, okay. it wouldn't be too much to 
to bear. But for him to say that you can't get public funds to do something like that. Isn't everything tax? Yeah, well, I'm not sure. Like the receiving fund or something like that. They, police station, the police department. Yeah. And they, uh, uh, police association. You know, they fund the uh, fishing go to downtown. No, he's not going to do that anymore. And, and the fire department. Fire department, they also have an association. I mean, it seemed to so be. Send, they send out letters. Yeah. We could send out a letter. All the more reason why yeah. we need to start yeah, early if we have to raise private funds to have a celebration. Yes. Yeah. I think we should send a letter to the original, you know, 30 people that lived here, their descendants, and say, you guys got to fund it. <laughs> Sadness and the whole Brooks and the who, who was here. Yeah. And the woods. The woods. The woods. <laughs> We expect a big check from them. <laughs> okay. You got it. You got it. All right. Does anybody have anything else before we adjourn? I do. Um, the Historical Society wanted me to ask the Historical Commission if we can put a link on the Historical Commission website to a research page. And I, Tom was supposed to send me that link, but I never, he never sent it to us. To a research page for what? Do you have the, do you remember what the research page is about, Joan? I, I, I've never seen it. I think it's like the roots, something or other, but there's some sort of research. So it would be on the Historical Society site. So it would be a link <laughs> to our site. No, I think it's on the, history. I think they were requesting that it be put on the Historical Commission site. And it's a link to the Historical Society's research page or something, but I'm not familiar with what this research page is exactly. I have no objection to it. I was curious exactly what the requirement is. Me too. I never, Tom never sent me the link. I mean, we're, we're interrelated, so there should be a link. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be on the commission's link on commission directly. Some research. Right. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So I'll tell, in any case, I'll tell Tom that we don't have an objection to that, but by the link, and so we can review it. I guess I was going to bring up one concern I had uh, watching last night's selectman meeting, where I was almost ready to dial off the meeting. I was extremely disappointed that there was nothing on the agenda for the Historic Society's presentation. And I'm quite surprised that neither Tom nor any of the members of the board didn't ask Sandra and Joe to be put on the agenda. I think he did that on purpose because he wanted to present that after the meeting. He didn't want it to be a matter of public. Yeah, he almost didn't get a chance to do it because it they... becomes a matter of public record. Didn't Tom say that that he did that on purpose that he didn't want it to be think, public? I think something to that <laughs> effect. Yeah. And he almost didn't get a chance to talk. Exactly, yeah. Because at the, the last meeting. minute, they adjourned the meeting. And, and they said, on a, on a but I wanted to speak in the public, you know, uh, forum. Well, they, they had screwed up the meeting. They adjourned yeah, without right. the public comment, which is on the agenda. Right. But I think he should have asked to be put on the agenda. Uh, so that it was documented. Was it public, his whatever he stated? Yeah, well, they had it. They had to unadjourn the meeting and then for them for him to speak and then they adjourned a second time. Yeah. He yeah. just read the letter. And was the feedback positive, negative, nothing? As I expected, there was no feedback. Okay. okay. It was, yep, yeah, okay, we'll take yeah. it under advisement. And Maureen Dwinnell is now the chair. Well, she was um, elected the chair at the beginning of the meeting. And um, Laura Hebb is our new selectman, select woman. And they said they would, I think they said they would provide some feedback in the coming couple of weeks. So, okay. which is good, which is good. But I think he should have made it a formal request to say, I want to be on the agenda so I can speak. Because mm -hmm. I think it's an important issue. And as I think I said, 
on the subject of holy angels, for instance, is there's no plan for holy angels. Um, and there's no plan for the Knowlton Ristine building. So might as well go in and say, we want to move to the first floor and we want some Come money to fix up the building. And whole lobby <clears throat> the last two days. Oh, you did? Yeah, and cleaned it up and vacuumed it. Oh, wow. We uh, took down all the library stuff that was in the hallway. We asked um, Matt about it. He said, no, we don't want any of that stuff. So we got rid of it all. It's all cleaned up. We're going to take William Knowlton's beautiful photograph that we have framed. I mean, it's this big, it's gorgeous. And we're going to hang it next to the uh, picture that the Eagle Scout painted of the um, hat factory. I said, this is the Rist Knowlton Ristine building. So let's put a picture of Mr. Knowlton right here in the lobby yeah. next to his hat shop. Yeah. So the only picture we have of Ella Ristine is about this big. <laughs> I wish we had a big picture of her, but next day. Speaking of Staples and that, we can pull them up. Yeah, yeah. If you want, yeah. Uh, the quality will be. Yeah, I was going to say the quality. <laughs> so anyway. Hey, Patrick. What's did, up? Did, didn't you have a comment last month about uh, doing something with Twitter and Instagram or something? Yeah, I did. I mean, right now, I think personally, we should just stick with one social media. Like, I think where we're at now, I think just the connectivity when it comes to all demographics from, let's say, lower 20s all the way up to 60 to 90 age group. It just makes more sense for us to stay on one than kind of branch out until I'd say we hit around 300 followers then i'd say we should probably talk about a twitter how many followers do we have we're at like 260. Okay. your salary goes up if you get over 300 you know well my goal by the end of 2023 i want to beat the historical society and i also want to beat the town <laughs> Okay. So maybe you put something on about the 300th anniversary coming up in what 12 years, and <laughs> you know people are getting excited already. <laughs> well, I did. Well, I did put I I did put a thing out saying I'm like save the date. It's coming. Oh right, you I did. Mean, I was like just I know where I'll be. Where will you be? And uh, I think someone commented. Um, someone said that I would be dead. So that was. <laughs> Bit of a gallows humor, but I was like, okay. Speaking of that, uh, I noticed there's a time capsule buried in the lawn of the Milton Steen building. Is that on the anniversary that we opened that? I don't know, but I had contributed to it with my class. Did you really? Yeah. Oh, was that my class? I don't know. <laughs> Did they ever open it? I thought they opened it. I thought they that, I yeah, think I it. I thought, I thought it was open. Didn't one of my oh. kids contribute to the time capsule? Probably. 35 years ago or something? Yeah. yeah. That might I be know. a nice, if it was on the same date, it might be a nice event for the for the birthday. But I think they already dug it up. Oh, they already dug it up. I don't know. <laughs> Could create a new one. Who do we ask? Barbara's gone. <laughs> <laughs> we could create a new one as part of the 300th annual celebration. A time right. capsule. It's not okay. a bad idea. Catherine, you got anything to uh, add? Subtract? Multiply? <laughs> I just wanted to mention I put a couple of things in the chat. I wasn't sure if you were seeing it. One of them is the little anecdote that you had mentioned about the guy who threw himself in the river, Cyrus Bale. And then the other thing is a link to where I think maybe Tom was talking about. There's a part of the society page that says research material and it has links to town reports and cemetery data. Um, I don't know if that's what he was talking about, but that's the that. part of their website that says research in the title. So um, I put that in the chat too for you guys. Catherine, could you send that to my personal email so I have yeah. the link? Okay, thank you. 
I'm not sure if you can see the chat on the screen there. But I know Patrick might be able to see it. (laughs) Yep. No, I, I see it. I just clicked on it. Yeah. I think that's what he's talking about. Because uh, uh, Tom actually mentioned at the selectman last night that I had used the uh, that link, the research to the cemeteries to rebuild the uh, Upton Cemetery database of 6,000 6, people buried here that had no dates in the cemetery records. The dates were all lost. So I rebuilt it. I doubt Mr. Glenn Fowler has done anything with it, but I still have all the data. But yeah. hopefully someday we'll get into the... Uh, the cemetery commissioner's database. Yeah, the, all the dates prior to about 1957 or eight were lost. So we have the names of everybody buried in Lakeview, but there were no dates, no death dates, no nothing. That's incredibly frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It took me three or four months to go through 6,000 names and I was left with about 230 or 40 that I could not put a date on. I couldn't figure out who they were. You know, and it's it's difficult when you got when you got a name, you don't know whether they died in 1840 or 1950 or, you know, you got no clues to who they were. All right, I'm going to make a motion that we adjourn this meeting, the next meeting to be held on July. July, July, July. July. Wealth, I believe. No, nope. I don't have it on my calendar. Craig, do you happen to have the date? Is it the 19th of July? Thank you. Thank you. I decided I last time to hold the meeting in April. I think something came up a couple of days. Yeah, we did all the dates in the in April. Did May. Okay, yes, we do have that. Um, uh, no meeting in June or August, July 19th. July 19th at 7 p.m. And because it's the third Wednesday of July, we'll probably be back in this room here because the zoning board meets the third Wednesday of every month downstairs. All right, so uh, motion to adjourn uh, our next meeting to be Wednesday, July 19th. Do I have a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Hearing everyone in favor in the affirmative, um, meeting is adjourned at 844. 844. Thank you.